Hello and welcome back to another episode. Today I'm quite excited about this one. Um, I'm going to be covering a subject which really is of great interest to me. Other than philately, one of my greatest uh, hobbies is um, reading up on NASA history, the history of the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo missions, as well as the later forays into space with Skylab, the Apollo Soyuz, and of course, one that we'll all be familiar with, which was the Space Shuttle program. Now, this particular piece here, I'm going to take it out of the plastic. This was a joint venture between the USPS and NASA. Um, and it was done as part of the 25th anniversary of NASA in 1983. NASA had been formed in 1958, shortly after the Russians had uh, launched Sputnik into space. You know, there was it was seen that the Americans needed to have a, you know, an agency that was investigating putting objects into space, whether that be uh, satellites, rockets, spacecraft, etc. So in 1983, NASA celebrated its 25th anniversary. And as part of that, it was decided that there was going to be a special cover that would be launched aboard the space shuttle uh, for one of its missions and that mission was STS-8 and that would have been on board the Challenger Orbiter now all space shuttle missions have a have a designation of STS which stands for Space Transit System um, the first mission STS-1 was quite a unique uh, flight in terms of NASA it was the first time that a spacecraft had actually been piloted on its maiden voyage in that it was a manned test flight so when Columbia launched in 1981 with um, Commander John Young and Bob Crippen on board they were essentially testing an untested in space vehicle and all the other components that went with that. Now, over the years, everything I've read and watched about those guys, John Young is probably my favourite of all the NASA astronauts. Just his, his laid-back attitude and his, he, he just got on with the job. Despite how dangerous, how, how much risk there was, he just kind of took it all as part of his, uh, his job. Uh, sadly, no longer with us. Uh, John Young died, I think, two or three years ago now. You know, there's not many of those uh, old school um, Mercury and Gemini and Apollo astronauts left with us. But yeah, the, as a kid, seeing the, you know, like things like the Columbia launch and landing, I can remember being sat in the front room with my mum and dad watching the watching the Columbia come into land after that first mission and just seeing seeing the pilot getting off. I didn't know who it was at the time, I wasn't that fully invested at the time. And just seeing the commander coming down the steps, you know, to uh back to Terra Firma. Just brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. So, yeah, let's open this up. And just to clarify something about when we say the space shuttle, the a lot of people think that the actual space plane, in this case on here, the, you know, the Challenger, is the space shuttle. But that's not strictly true. The space shuttle is actually the whole um, vehicle um, which combines the two solid rocket boosters and also the external fuel tank 
the whole system when integrated together is the shuttle the space plane is actually the orbiter so just something to clarify there now the as for the orbiters there were six of them developed and built the, the first of which was enterprise which was never intended to go into space it was used for atmospheric and flight testing here on earth that would have been the one that I'd, you've probably seen footage where it was strapped to the back of a nasa 747 carrier and essentially just dropped to come to a landing on a conventional runway so that's that's what the enterprise was used for those at uh, those flight tests now you know the pilots uh, like to say that the the orbiter itself has you know it has the the gliding capability of a brick you know the short stubby wings don't really generate any lift and when the orbiter vehicle comes back to earth after it's been you know in orbit around the earth it comes through the re-entry process um and then essentially it is a, a glide landing back to its designated landing site whether that be at edwards air force base or at florida so essentially the the pilot slows the vehicle down by doing a, a series of pitches and rolls just to take off some of that speed that's gained after coming in through re-entry yeah there, there is no power assistance on the landing the the engines are not used for anything to do with landing it's simply a, a, a glide pattern till touchdown so the way that the whole system works is as you can see here this is this is quite a clever photograph it's a double exposure what they've done is they've, they've took a photograph of the challenger on the launch pad here and still you know attached to the launch tower and they've then opened the doors but left the exposure running so if you can see it's kind of a blurry outline here but it just gives you like this sort of see-through x-ray vision into what's inside the, the you know the cargo bay so these here would be satellites and experimental objects that would be put into orbit so those would have been the primary missions of the shuttle but somewhere stowed in the cargo bay would have been the covers um, which is you can see it down here on the bottom right so STS-8 was only the third um, flight of the Challenger. The Challenger was the second of the fleet, or should I say the third of the fleet. The first was the Enterprise, the one that didn't go into space. The first one was the Columbia. The Columbia was a slightly different design than the others. And if you could, you could always tell the Columbia when when it was stood upright like this is it had black chines now on when i say black chines on this leading edge of the wing here on this this delta leading edge that was all black and as you can see here on the challenger that's it's a completely white wing but even everything else regarding the columbia because that was the first everything was slightly different so obviously improvements were made every time they developed a new orbiter so the challenger was the second um work working space uh, worthy orbiter um next came discovery um followed by atlantis and endeavor now out of those five um, sadly two of them were lost I'm pretty sure everybody knows the story of what happened to Challenger um, on STS 51L the Challenger uh, exploded shortly after takeoff 
essentially they'd, they'd launched successfully. They were throttled down, which was standard procedure. Um, whilst certain checks were made, instrumentation, everything else. Once given the go-ahead, they were then told to go to throttle up, which was to open the, you know, crank the engines up to 100% and get them up to the 17,000 miles an hour necessary to leave Earth's atmosphere. Now, what had happened was, it was a... It was a cold spell at Florida in January of 86, and just not typical weather patterns, and every morning the, the shuttle was covered in ice, so they delayed and delayed, and until it came to a point where they just decided that it was fine, the sun had come out, there was enough, you know, enough of the ice had, had broken off and it would be a safe uh, condition to launch. But what had happened was, within one of the solid rocket boosters, there were, these were made up of sections of the propellant and they were all isolated from each other using um, silicon rubber O-rings, a bit like what you get on anything where you, you'll see like a little rubber band as a as a connector to keep something it's normally it's in keeping something waterproof, you know if you've got like a waterproof torch if you take the, if you screw the end off you'd see there'll be like a little rubber O-ring but yeah these O-rings, one of those had um, hardened due to freezing and it wasn't doing its job properly and it, it had opened a gap that allowed you know some gases to come into contact with the large orange external fuel tank and that ignited and that's what, what blew the the shuttle apart you've probably seen the dreadful images of that you just see the two solid rocket boosters just jet off from a, a central explosion and they're kind of just like winding and off on their own path and they're destroyed remotely then by um, ground control so yeah that was on its 10th mission but this mission in particular that we're talking about today is STS-3 and this was only the uh, sorry STS-8 and this was only the third mission of Challenger's career at this time. Now, another quick interesting fact. Um, out of the five orbiters that did go into space, there is only one astronaut who actually flew on board all five of them. And this is a chap called uh, Story Musgrave. He'd been with NASA from the 1960s. Um, he was a Capcom capsule communicator during the Apollo missions and he eventually graduated into a position where he would go into space on the shuttle program and he was a, he was a, played a big part in that. But yeah, he's the only astronaut to have flown on all five of the orbiters, so quite a unique feet so yeah the challenger was lost in 86 and this week unfortunately marks the 20th anniversary since the columbia was lost under slightly different circumstances the columbia um upon launch had suffered what was known as a foam strike now the orange external fuel tank is covered with this insulating foam and what had happened was during launch a piece of the foam had broke off and smashed into the leading edge of one of the wings. Actually, it was the, the wing on this side. And it created a, it had smashed some of the heat shielding off the leading edge of the wing. So, unfortunately, the, the crew and even ground control were, were unaware of just what danger the crew were in at the time. So they continued with the mission they had two weeks in space everything was was successful you know you, you could see the footage being being back everybody was happy and they came to re-entry and b-17 
because of the damage that had been caused to the leading edge of the wing there was no uh, thermal protection so you can imagine the extreme temperatures of re-entry that allowed all the um, plasma and heat and gas to build up and actually get inside the um, the spacecraft itself and essentially it just broke apart and that was you know that was a, another one of those really vivid and horrifying moments where you can see it streaking across the sky it looks like a load of shooting stars and yeah just just really sad that you know if, if they'd have known about it that something could have been done but because it was uh because it was like unknown as to what was going to happen you know nothing nothing was changed in the flight plan and sadly you know that accident occurred it did actually revise how future shuttle missions went um, it became standard operating procedure that the uh, shuttles would rendezvous with the ISS and they would do a 360 degree sort of rotation so that the crew on board the ISS could view the thermal shield and point out any, anything that was a compromise. Because in, in those kind of situations what they could have done is the crew could have docked with the ISS and remained there until another shuttle could come up either to repair the damaged shuttle or to just take them home or they could have even used one of the Russian aircraft one of the Soyuz capsules that was also capable of docking with the ISS but yeah unfortunately those uh, those didn't factor into the, the mission at the time. So anyway, let's move on to the cover itself. Now, this is the rear of the cover. And I'm, in fact, I'm going to pop it out of its... Uh, so on the rear of the cover here, you can see it's got a... It's got a number stamped on it. That's probably <laughs> what number it is in the... Uh, number of these these are not a rare item at all there's roughly i think 250 to 300 thousand of these covers but yeah it's got the nice little cachet there the 20 25 years anniversary of nasa 1958 to 83 and this nice little uh, circular date stamp return to earth september the 5th 1983 which coincidentally is the day before my birthday that was the day before my 13th birthday. Um, Edwards Air Force Base, California. And on the front, you know, it looks like a typical first day cover with, again, a nice cachet. That's the actual mission patch for STS-8 with the names of the astronauts, which is, that's kind of a standard design for patches for the missions and if we go from here we've got a date stamp there August 14th 1983 Kennedy Space Center Florida and then if we look up here we've got another CDS launched August the 30th which was the actual launch date aboard Challenger and then here on the You know, on this uh, particular cancellation, it has a reproduction of that cache there, the 25th anniversary space mail orbited via STS-8. And again, there's that return to Earth, September the 5th, 83, Edwards Air Force Base. Now, I, uh, when I got this, I, I, I'm, I don't know, I'm just so excited. I was so excited to get this. I mean, look at the stamp itself you know the american eagle there is like the bald eagle you know and the the moon in the background you know value of nine dollars 35 
absolutely beautiful stamp but getting hold of this this is something that as a kid again everything this is the, the what i love about this hobby is it gives me these feelings of, of almost childlike wonder again because i know that as a, as a child that if i'd have received this as a child uh, you know 13 14 when i was just starting to collect stamps seriously this would have just blown my mind you know it'd be like it's been into space and it has you know it's not every day that you get to hold an item that you can say has has been into space and orbited the earth so i think it's a wonderful absolute wonderful little piece you know and just seeing it you know in black and white return to earth launched aboard challenger and you know the bittersweet side of it is it can never be launched aboard challenger ever again you know that craft having been lost i mean it couldn't be launched aboard any of the other shuttles you know the orbiters that came after challenger were discovery endeavor atlantis you know they were all atlantis was the last one to fly but even that was coming up on 12 years ago so they've now all been retired i was very lucky in 2017 to spend a couple of weeks staying with my best friend from england um at his apartment in philadelphia he offered to put me up for a couple of weeks if i wanted to come over and have a bit of a holiday do some uh, sightseeing and what have you and we went to the smithsonian we went to washington dc for the weekend jumped on the train on the saturday morning and headed down to dc to with a plan to stay overnight and to return on to philadelphia on the sunday evening and on the saturday we did all the usual touristy things the white house lincoln memorial the reflecting pool the washington monument and from there we headed over to the air and space museum on the mall now this had some wonderful nasa related uh, uh spacecraft and paraphernalia there there was like things like the lunar module there were mercury and gemini capsules the apollo soyuz docking is actually present at the you know at the at the smithsonian it's suspended from the from the ceiling so you've got the apollo command module docked nose to nose with one of the russian soyuz capsules now on the sunday we took a trip out to the stephen udvar hazy center at dulles airport where they've got further um exhibits they've got some of the larger craft they've got things like the the sr-71 blackbird there's a the enola gay famous for dropping the first atomic bomb on japan is there there's a concord and the best thing that i saw there was the um, orbiter discovery and uh I've just realized you've never seen my face on any of these videos but i'm gonna drop a couple of pictures in and this is me geeking out at the udvar hazy center but yeah absolutely fantastic if you're ever in dc and you get the opportunity to visit those sites please do they're free of charge with them being smithsonian uh, museums you know you can spend just a whole day walking around and just soaking in the history and i've found it to be one of the best things it's one one of those things that you know on your bucket list you know 10 years prior to that if somebody had asked me where do i want to go i would have said the smithsonian air and space i want to see those spacecraft you know and there's even more stuff there now from when i went they've opened up a lot of other exhibits relating to the apollo missions but um yeah 
just to bring things back to philately i don't want to wander off too much but just having this wonderful piece that just brings out the best of you know of, of the hobby for me just something as innocuous as a little cover with three uh, cds stamps on it there and it i think it's it, this is probably one of the one of the most important things in my collection now i know it's not valuable you can pick these up on ebay for probably 12 dollars around that price that's why i paid for this one but that was in the us so it was 12 dollars plus plus postage to the uk i've seen them for more some people are trying to get ridiculous amounts of money whether it's because they've got much lower uh serial numbers on the back but you know some people are asking over a hundred dollars for them but uh yeah certainly wouldn't pay that but this isn't the end of uh space mail there is another item and unfortunately that is one that is way beyond my reach um the, there were some covers taken to them to the lunar surface on apollo 15 now there was a huge controversy around that and I'm not going to go into any detail. What I will do is ask you if that's something that you're interested in to go and have a look at Exploring Stamps, Graham Beck's uh, channel. He does a fantastic episode covering the Apollo 15 stamps and uh, the surrounding uh, Ferrari that occurred. Yeah, it resulted in two astronauts from being essentially banned from spaceflight. Um, due to the way they'd uh, taken things to the moon that they shouldn't have and it was deemed they were doing it for their own profit which is something that NASA just did not allow as it's funded by the taxpayers so yeah if you go and have a look at Graham's uh, channel you may have already seen that but yeah fantastic episode on Apollo 15 over at Exploring Stamps so I hope you've enjoyed this uh, little dig into probably you've probably found out a little bit more about me and how just really how geeky I, I can be on a, on a particular topic but this is one that you know it really is dear to my heart and yeah anything I can get my hands on to watch documentary wise you know I've got certain documentaries that I watch them time and time again every year I'll, I'll wheel them out and just marvel at uh, the wonderful achievements of some of the, you know, men, essentially just normal people who did something wonderful. You know, even, even to the, you know, the, the ground crews who came up with the solutions to help Apollo 13 return to Earth safely just just marvelous all proper exciting boys on stuff but yeah if you're interested in the like i said the sts 8 flight cover you can pick this up for around about 12 dollars you might pay a little bit more and then obviously ship into wherever you are in the world but definitely a piece that I would recommend you, you go out there and, and grab. Like I say, it's not a rare piece at all. It's not an investment. But for me, it's just something marvellous to have. And I can say now that I've held something in my hands that has left the Earth. And, you know, orbited the Earth. And has been into space. Aboard, you know, aboard a spacecraft. So thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Um, I shall see you all on the next one. Just a quick reminder. In my last episode, episode 20, I started a giveaway. Um, if you haven't seen that already, jump on over to episode 20. And the details on how to enter the giveaway for some free stamps are all in that episode. 
So go over there, give that a watch, and if you're interested, then claim your entry in the co in the comment section in the manner that I, I, I detail in the video. Um, next episode will be coming on Saturday or Sunday. I'm not sure yet as of which day, but definitely there will be an episode this weekend. So, from a horrible, cold, rainy northwest England, um, until next time, stay safe, stay warm, and bye for now.